Hi there. Today I'm going to talk about the book Merlin, the engine that won the Battle of Britain in World War II, written by Graham Hoyland. Now this tells the story of the famous Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. However, uh, I was 10 chapters into the book uh, before the Merlin is even mentioned. And this is because the book provides uh, a terrific uh, history of both manned flight and the internal combustion engine. And the author, uh, Mr. Hoyland, makes it really, really fascinating. He's got a, a background in engineering and he describes things in a, a really easy to understand way and uh, ma makes it very, very interesting. So uh, man had long wanted to imitate the birds and fly and um, obviously the first efforts were to mimic the action of the birds, the way the birds' wings flapped, for example. But it was soon found out that power to weight um, meant that un unless you had some sort of um, power pack, um, this was impossible. And uh, such power packs were far beyond the scope of those times. The actual physics had been worked out in 1799 by George Cayley um, with the, um, the vectors of uh, lift and drag uh, and thrust and weight, for example. Uh, he, he described how these all interacted. Uh, so that was known, but uh, as we all know, it was really the uh, Wright brothers who solved the problem. And they had a powered uh, aircraft. The interesting thing was, even though this was absolutely um, history making, the only references to it at the time appeared in a magazine about beekeeping. Uh, and the Smithsonian for uh, many years actually denied that the Wright brothers were the pioneers and attributed it to someone else. And so much so that the Wright brothers actually sent their original aircraft, <coughs> the flyer, over to England. And it was in the museum over here for, for quite a while before the Smithsonian um, recanted their position. And now you, you, you can see the flyer there. The book describes the development of aviation from the Wright brothers onwards. And uh, I was particularly interested in all the various uh, challenges and air races that were um, undertaken. And they, these were massive at the time, uh, really did hit the, the popular interest. Um, so many people um, were influenced uh, into aviation, guys who later fought in, in the various wars as pilots by seeing uh, one of the early aircraft, probably a biplane, land in a nearby pasture. And this was akin now to seeing the space shuttle come and land uh, in your neighbourhood. You know, it, it was that that much of a, of a, a, a massive, massive um, event. <clears throat> Air races went the length of Africa, uh, across the Pacific to Australia, all this kind of thing. And um, in, in the era now where we take things for granted, flying in um, our luxury uh, passenger jets, uh, you've got to realise just what a difficult undertaking they were. Quite often in open cockpits, unheated. Uh, they didn't really understand altitudes and oxygen and things like that. Um, the facilities en route were quite often lacking. In one case, one of the leading aircraft that was that was winning a race landed to refuel, and the locals in Africa filled the uh, petrol tanks with water instead. So it was all this kind of thing, and the book takes you into it, and and also the characters involved. Some of them were, were really amazing characters, uh, men and women. He then uh, talks about the internal combustion engine and how it was developed and how various mechanical 
uh, material and fuel uh, problems were solved to produce the internal combustion engine, um, which powers our vehicles. However, all those problems are nothing compared to getting an, uh, an engine that will work in an aircraft, which you know can be thrown around the sky um, in, in various uh, maneuvers. So the engine has to be tremendously reliable. If your car engine stops, that's an inconvenience, but if your aircraft engine stops, it can be fatal. And um, also the, the weight had to be a factor. Uh, various types of engines uh, were developed, inline cylinders, uh, rotary engines where the cylinders themselves rotated, radial engines, which the cylinders were um, radial around the um, crankshaft, but they, they were stationary and the crankshaft turned. Generally speaking, the crankshaft had to um, be stepped down to turn the propeller because uh, the propeller had to had to go fast, but it couldn't approach the speed of sound, so the revs had to be um, geared down. He has a lot of material about Rolls and Royce, um, the two geniuses who came together to form the company, um, one very aristocratic and one more of an engineer, and they... Um, you know, they worked originally on cars, um, the famous um, Silver Cloud, things like that. Um, the epitome at the time and subsequently of, of luxury and uh, reliability. That was their watchword. And it was done by very, very painstaking engineering practices and research and development. Not necessarily always inventing the things, but perfecting them. Uh, so that really brings us to the Merlin, the Rolls-Royce Merlin, which, as the book says, won the Battle of Britain and basically helped to win the Second World War. The German equivalent was the Daimler-Benz engine, which was in the Messerschmitt and other aircraft and some of the bombers. And they were both actually influenced by an American Curtis engine, uh, which was interesting, but... Uh, the Merlin and the DB both took the design and ran with it in different directions. Um, each had its good points and its bad points. One of the uh, things about the Daimler-Benz engine was because of the fuel injection, it could fly inverted without uh, interruption. Whereas the Merlin um, originally, and, and similar engines, if the aircraft was inverted, you, you'd get a fuel stoppage for a, at least a second. You get a hiccup, which if if um, you're trying to chase an enemy or if an enemy was on your tail, it could be um, very, very embarrassing. But they overcame that by uh, mechanical means. So the Merlin, um, and there's a lot of information in the book about the Schneider Trophy and the design of the Spitfire. And the Spitfire eventually emerged with its elliptical wings, which were very, very efficient, and he describes why they worked so well. Uh, but mated with the Merlin engine, uh, some of the original prototypes had other weaker engines. I think it was the Kestrel engine. and uh, But the Merlin was the one that, that really worked. And uh, it, it was a dream, also fitted to the Hurricane. And um, although the Spitfire is the glamour fighter of the Battle of Britain, the Hurricane was equally uh, important. And in some some ways, uh, it, it had advantages. For example, because it still had the fabric skin, it was less susceptible to damage than the, um, the Spitfire. The other problem about the Spitfire was you had the propeller, you had the engine, then you had f a fuel tank and then the pilot. So the pilot was sitting immediately behind fuel tanks. If they were punctured, the heat of the engine would ensure that there was a fire that was blown back into the pilot and then terrible consequences if you're, fl you know, you're flying, trying to get out of the aircraft through the flames. A lot of pilots were burned as a result. Um, so 
The other thing about the British fighters, the book doesn't really make a lot of this, but it's, it is a point, is that they tended to be um, equipped with machine guns, .303, whereas the Germans had a cannon, and the cannon were much more effective, given the fact that you generally in a dogfight you had a very brief burst, so you wanted that burst to um, really um, be effective maximum effect and the 20 millimeter cannon shells would would be much more effective also some of the german engines had a hollow crankshaft and this allowed a cannon to fire through the propeller hub so you didn't have the problems of harmonizing the guns it was a, a direct very easy to aim and uh, tremendously effective at the beginning of world war ii both sides had some very dodgy aircraft mainly because they were obsolete. The fairy battle comes in for a lot of um, justified criticism and the losses, particularly uh, in the battle for France, of fairy battles were um, absolute, absolutely devastating. Um, the German bomber, the Heinkel III, was similarly a very old design. It was obsolete by the time of the war, although the Junker 88 was a much better design. However, um, Interference by high levels of the Luftwaffe, I think it was Udet, um, stipulated that it had to be able to perform as a dive bomber as well, which hindered its development and its, its uh, performance somewhat. Another area where the Merlin um, came into its own was Avro had a design of an aircraft called an Avro Manchester, which was a twin engine, and it was a almost as bad as the Heinkel III, um, but by uh, equipping it with four engines, lengthening the wings, uh, putting four engines on and making those engines Merlin, that became the Lancaster, which was the best heavy bomber of World War II, without doubt. And, um, you know, things like the Dam Busters raids and the, the mass... Uh, bombing of Germany by Lancasters and, and, and similar heavy bombers. Then another amazing aircraft, the Mosquito, which uh, was virtually a private development by uh, de Havilland. The Air Ministry didn't really want it, but he persevered wooden aircraft and um, that was equipped with Merlins as well. And it could actually outfly most fighters in its bomber configuration. They also used it as a, as a twin engine fighter, uh, for, mainly for fighter ground attack. Uh, the Merlin was eventually um, superseded by the Griffin, but uh, which uh, equipped the Tempest, which was a superb aircraft. The Griffin was actually an earlier design than the Merlin, funny enough. But um, because of its size, they sidelined it and then um, was were able to rate the power enough to, to make it the successor. Then the limits of um, propeller-driven aircraft became apparent towards the end of the war and the jet came into its own. Now, the jet was obviously famously invented by Frank Whittle. He was working at RAF Cranwell and he offered the design to the Cranwell Engineering Department, but they'd had a letter from some professor saying that it wouldn't work, and they declined it. He was very short of money, and he couldn't renew the patent on it, which was £5. Patent ran out, the Germans ran with it, and they were the first, with the ME262, etc., to um, have jet uh, fighters or jet aircraft. Again... The Luftwaffe insisted on all sorts of design uh, modifications and they weren't as successful as they could have been. There's a quote at the end of the book and I, I found this amazing quote or amazing to read this quote that the German who ran with the uh, Frank Whittle's patent and developed the jet engine in Germany said that had Whittle uh, been allowed to um, continue his work 
the British would have had a jet fighter uh, six years uh, or several years before the war actually began. And this would then have um, caused Hitler and Goering to uh, take stock and go, well, the British have got a 500 mile an hour jet fighter we're not going to go near them. There probably wouldn't have been a World War II. Now, that might be a, a massive overstatement, but it's certainly food for thought. I found the book fascinating. I'm always interested in um, aviation subjects, and this really um, covers a lot of bases. Uh, and anyone who's got any kind of interest in um, military aviation will find this a delight. <laughs>